Welcome to the Inquisitive Rent Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. Join us as we explore diverse perspectives on the human experience, offering insightful interviews and deep reflections on philosophy, spirituality, psychology, from a bird's eye view on the essence of being. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Inquisitive Rin Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. Thank you so much for joining me for season four. I'm so happy to be back. It's been lovely to have a nice break, but it's great to also be back. And as you all know, we record, we try and do about 24 episodes per season. So this is season four, and I can only post two a month. So we do a twice monthly podcast, and it works at the moment. Uh, we do take a break around the Christmas time. A lot of it's because there's a lot of different celebrations. There's a lot of people with birthdays around me during December, uh, January. There's lots of activity and it's just very, very busy. So we tend to take a break and, but you know, I think this season we're going to ensure that we've got at least one episode during that time uploaded for you because we're very aware that a lot of people take a break around that time, like, like us. But also you may be in the mood for an episode. You may be in the mood for a podcast. So we will seek to do that this season. We're starting out season four with a really positive new energy. I mean, it's usually positive anyway. That's just how I'm inclined. This this season, we have got some very interesting guests. As always, we've got... We have people who will be experts in uh, mental health. Uh, We have people that will be talking to regarding spirituality, all aspects of that. Uh, It'll be very, very interesting. We talk a bit about grief and bereavement, and we're going to speak to people who deal with people day to day about their everyday lives. The podcast is really about pondering life from a bird's eye view. And I've always thought the highest and best view is the highest one or the best view is the highest one, which is why I love mountains. I like climbing and visiting uh, countries where there are absolutely amazing mountains uh, that you you know you can climb you can just sit and relax and think and ponder it's just the air is so different the higher you get and it's so unnatural flying in a plane you you're up there but you you can't see past a point as we all know at any rate i hope you've all been doing well and that you've had a good summer a uh, very good positive time good things happening in your lives you know, we we will have the challenges as well. We need the ups so that when the downs come, we know that it's, you know, cyclical. It will happen. You've got to have one with the other. There is no way around that, but it's all about perception. And I was listening to someone recently talk about how they perceive their lives versus how other people perceive their lives. And it is very interesting, but I think we also need to be cognizant and mindful of the fact that we're responsible for how we view the world, those within our world, and also how we perceive our future as well. And there's been a lot of talk about future projection, and I've all, which I have always loved. A lot of us do have uh, premonitions in dreams and just flashes of inspiration that end up coming true. So we'll be looking at all those areas in the podcast. I love to meet new people as well. Now, some people that I'm interviewing this season will be familiar. They'll be friends. They'll be other people I know in different ways. Um, that we may have a returning guest or two. Stay tuned. It's great. Um, I love it when people return and come back. 
my guests are very interesting people. They are very learned. Uh, they're busy. They're active. They're proactive. They're making some type of impact in whatever way in the world. And an impact in the world doesn't have to be a celebrity-like impact. It doesn't have to be all over the news. But, you know, I started this podcast during the lockdown uh, because I had a very active life outside of my work. And a lot of it was outside of the home as well. But during lockdown, I was missing that creativity, that creative spark. There's ways in which I create. Yes, I'm a writer. I love doing that. I paint, things like that. I love music, dancing, there are lots of creativity in all that way. However, I do like a part of my creativity involves mixing with other people, being around other people. I can tolerate it to a certain uh, point, to a certain extent, and then I like to come back to my beautiful safe haven uh, for, for um, I suppose, relaxation and uh, just a safe space. And your that's what your home should be. So I was missing some of that creativity and so I started a podcast. Now, my friend Ruthie Phillips, who I interviewed in season one, she did a podcast 10 years, not longer than that, maybe 14 years ago. And I was one of her first guests. So podcasts have been around for donkey's years. And it was just nice to return the favor as such and have her on the show in season one. Wow, way back in season one. But um, that's been now a while. Now, our episodes, 20 to 24 episodes, aren't. it's not necessarily a yearly thing. I mean, we start in October usually, we take a break, and then we end again in sort of August. And But we do take a break because we must and I must. And so I'm very aware, though, that that doesn't mean everybody else has to take a break. Today on the show, I am so pleased to welcome John Nelson. And John is an advocate for mental health. He's a healthcare communications executive in the biopharmaceutical space. And that's been for over 20 years. So he's a tireless advocate for this. He's a voice. He's helping to pulverize the stigma of mental health. And it's something I'm very passionate about, having worked within the field for many, many years. I am so aware of that stigma. I may have carried some of the stigma myself. I looked at people a certain way. We can all do that. Now, sometimes it's for a reason. Clinically, you're looking, you're, you're being aware. However, you do have to be aware of different things. Now, quick story here. I was visiting a friend's home and she and her husband, they, they have a, two dogs and a cat. Now, she had just bought the cat one of those laser uh, light things. Now, I know some people are against them. Some people are for them. I'm not here to debate either way. But they got the laser out and the cat was just really running around trying to chase the laser, of course. And her son said, look at him, he's going mad. Look at this cat, he's crazy, he's going mad, he's going mad. Now, that's a phrase. We know that that's well embedded in within the English language. It's a phrase that people use a lot. Uh, I suppose it would be, um, I suppose, a, a quick go-to, something like... Um, Oh, I don't know. Nothing comes to mind. But there's, there's, we all know lots of phrases that we say without thinking. That doesn't mean just because the cat was running around in circles trying to catch the laser. That doesn't mean the cat has a mental health issue. Although, <laughs> although uh, the father believes the cat has all sorts of things. The father thinks the cat, well, the cat is unique. He sits like a human he, if you leave any kind of uh, alcohol beverage lying around, the cat will drink it. <laughs> the cat jumps up before the doorbell rings. The cat will uh, just hop on somebody's head and then hop off. This cat is unique. 
and very special. And we all love this cat. Whoever visits and when you visit, yes, we love to see the family, but we're also there to see the animals. The dogs are quite special as well. But this cat rules, totally rules. And so we love this cat, but <laughs> the son said, oh, look, he's mad. He's going mad. Now, this is a phrase, and when we're looking at the stigma and, and the wording and what we use, we do know that luckily and very happily, social awareness, culture is changing, has changed. And present day, it's making us all a bit more aware of the words we use, the phrases we say, and how we relate to everything in life. Some things are no longer acceptable. We know that, and for good reason. That's a phrase that will have to be looked at. But when it relates to a cat chasing around a laser, it was an innocent, you know, this, this boy's 15. He's not doing that and saying that for any other reason, but he's learned the phrase and he's heard it over and over again somehow. It's embedded in our minds. It's a part of English language now, or phrases, it's a phrase. And so I, you know, I'm not going to chastise him and say, oh, you know, you can't say that about a cat because that's stigmatizing this cat. Although this cat probably wouldn't mind, but, um, and the cat wouldn't agree, probably would not agree that it's a stigmatization. I think the cat, this cat is very perceptive, receptive, and a genius in my opinion. <laughs> in my opinion, this is a genius cat. And, you know, I mean, we have cats. I come home and this cat's lovely, beautiful, wonderful cats, but they're not doing these kinds of, you know, heroic things, all sorts of things this cat opens doors you know anyway this cat although actually I did have a cat once that opened a door yeah did did definitely had a cat Ferdinand bless him he used to open doors um oh I miss Ferdinand he lived to a nice ripe old age he's a lovely lovely cat absolutely gorgeous um, beautiful, quite a big black and white cat, just loving, so loving, very loving cat. Anyway, yes, he could open doors, but this cat is special. Anyway, I'm not going to say, look, you can't use that phrase. This cat, you're stigmatizing this cat. You're saying this cat has mental health issue. No, no, this is not the case. Um, now, some phrases, of course, need to be absolutely abandoned 100% completely. And m for the most part, they have been relating to mental health. They, some, a lot of these phrases have been. I think, though, that we just need to be aware of the context in which we use them. Now, there's a, we can do a huge debate on that another day, another show, another podcast, another platform even. But Today, John, what I love about John, and one of the reasons I asked him to be on the show is because John is a straight shooter. My favorite type of people, he says what he means, he means what he says, he knows exactly what he's talking about. He's an expert by experience. He has suffered from depression for decades, and he underwent this very revolutionary surgery He's going to tell you all about it. That has been successful. It's amazing. And it's one of the reasons why we really wanted to use this picture on the thumbnail. John, I, you know, I said he was very brave and courageous. But, you know, he reminded me that actually he didn't feel he had any other choice. So, OK, we can look at it as brave and courageous. However, not really. It's not really that. It's that, hey, I don't want to live like this anymore. I can't bear this. It's awful. And that's the other thing. He's very straightforward about how bad it can get for people. And this is what I appreciate. John really talks to us, lets us know, lets us in to his life, lets us into his daily life as well. I mean, he's a busy man. He's got, you know, children. He's, you know, happily married. Lots of positive things in his life. And it's just a testimony that this disease, which can be debilitating for anyone, can be helped. 
and it ca- it can be something that seems seems insurmountable. However, if you keep trying, keep pushing, and if the research continues, so there's lots of research still being done, and thank goodness that particular piece of research led to a particular you know team of people that John linked with, and the operation was completed and successful. But he will fill you in on that. He's overcoming, and I believe he's helping a lot of people to overcome that stigma. You know, feeling as if you're, you're tainted somehow because you may have a mental health issue. And in today's world, you know, yes, okay, people can be resilient about treating physical health problems like high blood pressure or stroke or dementia or diabetes, you know, cancer, you can go into remission, but it was always there and there there could always be the fear that it could return. So John chooses to look at things as they are. And that's what I like. He's very straightforward. He currently serves as a strategic advisor for different nonprofits, including One Mind and also Mental Health Collaborative. And he's an advisor to Motif Neurotech, which develops uh, minimally invasive biotronics to treat and monitor severe mental illness. Now, this is huge. Research will always be huge. When people say, oh, research, who needs it? We need it. We will always need research. Science, and, and that's what science is all about. That's the purpose of science is to research. You must continue to test any hypothesis, find out something new. What if Einstein said, oh, forget the research. I believe what I believe. We can all have beliefs, but, you know, it's nice to have what is behind it. How And in doing so, I believe, and in researching during the process, you're open to finding lots of other pathways to health and well-being. So I'm pleased to have John on the show. He supports the charity One Mind, and I'm going to let him tell you all about that. Before we move on to the interview, I want to just remind you to please like the video, subscribe to the channel. You know, subscribing to the channel is free. And when I when I look at that, okay, when I think, okay, if I when I'm watching a YouTube channel, when do I subscribe? When do I turn on notifications? You might subscribe to someone and not even turn on your notifications. Well, I notice my habits with YouTube. If I watch something twice, at least twice, if I watch a channel twice, I'm subscribing. That's enough for me. I know then that, yes, I'm interested. The odds of me not being interested are few and far between. And therefore, I'm going to then turn on my notifications because I want to know when they upload again. Now, some episodes you may not be interested in. That's fine. However, just be given the choice. Be given the choice to say, nope, that one's not for me, but I'll listen to that one or I'll watch that one. Speaking of listening, if you're listening on Apple and Spotify, oh, by the way, lovely, lovely story. A gentleman recently said to me, he's new to the podcast, but this was shocking. He, I said, you know, because I had to ask, how did you find the podcast? He said that he <laughs> he had been listening to one of the housewives shows and my podcast came up as a recommendation. That was really nice. Um, I don't know how that happens. The algorithm will never be explained. All the videos, you can watch them day after day after day. Nobody knows. It's like a secret club, I think the algorithm is. It's like the Illuminati. So forget it. You know it exists, but you're never going to know what the algorithm does or how it works. So I've given up. I suggest you to do too. I've given up on working out the algorithm. It's a secret club. We're not going to get in. We're only subjected to it. We can do what we can. But I don't know how that came up because of housewives. But whatever. I'm pleased. Nevertheless, I'm just pleased. Anyway, he was saying to me that he has to get a train into London at 5, 10 a.m. every day because he lives in the suburbs. And that's when he listens to the show when he's on the train. He says it lessens his anxiety 
which is nice. He likes my voice, which is lovely, but it lessens his anxiety. So that's lovely. Um, but I'm saying all that because if you if you listen on Apple or Spotify, there is a subscription service. It's two ninety nine a month, but Apple has one that is three months free. So you know it's a way to support the podcast. So if you like what you hear, if you find yourself listening or watching all the time, and it's saved in your app in your podcast app. Why not just subscribe to it, or at least get do do the free version? Just subscribe, and whilst you're there, leave us a lovely comment. These comments help always on YouTube, on all of them, Spotify, Apple. A review will really help. It helps us to move forward. But more importantly, you know, it's not a vanity thing. It's important for us to know what was helpful. What wasn't? What you like? Perhaps what you didn't like? It's helpful f- feedback. Feedback is always helpful. I welcome it, and you can do that by leaving a review. We love it if it's five star. <laughs> that would be great.、Uh, James and I are talking about ways as well to support you even more by offering free coaching sessions. So stay tuned for that. Some things are coming up there. Um, but we, what we want to do, our goal is to grow the podcast a bit more before I can start offering that. And we're on our way, which is good, and it's just helpful. So I'm appreciative for whatever you do. But if you would like to support the podcast, that's one way to do it. But by all means, click the like button and all of that stuff. John's social media will be in the links in the show notes. As always, all the links will be in the show notes. So go and follow him. He's got a great website up with lots of information, some free information as well. Welcome to the show, John Nelson. Here's the interview. So, John, welcome and thank you so much for being on the show today. Can't tell you how much I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. Oh, it's our pleasure. Now let's start out with stigma. To you and for you, what does it mean to be stigmatized? So, in general, stigma is feeling awkward all the time. It's feeling ashamed of something that you have that you didn't ask for, and it feels like constant judgment. And you know, I'm an empath. I'm an emotional person. I'm a third. I'm a middle child. I feel everything, and so、uh, dealing with what I went through, and I know we'll get into it, while being stigmatized for a decade, has、uh, really, really fueled me to go out and punch the stigma directly in the face as often as I can. Yes. Oh, that's such a good description because it really is、um, like a label and. I often find very unfair beliefs around, is particularly mental health. Yep, and that's that's actually the the greatest part about it is it's 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 well, fraudulent's not the right word, but it's it's it, it's wrong. Like the the fact that people support it and promote it、um, is is absolutely false, and and that's the thing that really really upsets me is because when you think of stigma and mental illness. That's what causes majority of people to die, and a very simple fact that I have to support that is the average person with depression waits about a decade to seek treatment. One hundred percent. That's because of the stigma. So imagine any other condition. Let's look at diabetes. Let's look at cancer. Right? You sit at home in isolation and not trying to talk about your condition and not get treatment for ten years. How many limbs are you going to have left, right? With with diabetes, how, I mean, how 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 survivable are you going to be from a cancer standpoint, right? So when we go into this mental health system and we're trying to we're trying to cure ourselves after ten years of a disease fostering inside your body, it's pretty hard to treat, right? I mean, think think about that. Like that's the environment that our society has created because of false information. That's ridiculous. That's why people die. That's why I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. But why do you think people either fear speaking about it, or fear knowing about it, 
or even fear being around people who may struggle. Why is that? False, false pretenses, false understanding. I think in, in general, if I had to explain mental health and mental illness and society, um, society started the problem, right? Institutionalizing people, um, the, the kind of shock therapy that happened uh, originally, and it was very barbaric, right? So you have, let's put them away. Um, and so I think, you know, when you look back to 60, 70, 80 years ago, that's how it was handled. And so that's that's continued to stay with that older generation. I, I look at the different levels of generations by how stigmatized it is. I will give an absolute pound, you know, fist bump to the younger generation because they're far more accepting of mental illness and mental mental health. The older the generations, um, it's harder. Um, you know, different ethnicities, it's harder, right? Like it's it's just completely ingrained. Um, and and that's the, the the coolest part about it, though, is it's ingrained because society has taught them to to grow up that way and to learn and understand that way. Um, but society is wrong. Um, they did this the wrong way, and so I'm proof of that. And that's why this is fun is I'm, I'm not saying anything that that isn't true. And that's, that's what I love. Like when I when I get talk and people get upset about certain things, I'm like, I'm just saying facts, you know, you may not want to hear them, but you're you're hearing facts. And so it, I'm proving what you are feeling thinking um, is wrong. And, I, and I'll tell you something too, like when, when you think about stigma, you know, stigma it affects the people who are sick, right? I mean, that that's why the people are, are sitting inside because they're they're wondering like, what's going on with me? I don't get it. You know, like I, like society doesn't want me is, is going to judge me, label me, right? So I'm I'm feeling I'm feeling bad. I'm I'm part of the reason that I'm staying in, and you know, stigma can be. Um, could be outwardly facing, you know, it could be you talking to your friend about your other friend who's sick, like, what do they have to be, what do they have to be depressed for, you know, like, get over it, dude, they got everything, right? So you can have the outwardly facing stigma, you can also have inwardly. And so the inwardly is, I think, the biggest challenge that we have. And so when your friend gets diagnosed with cancer, your initial thought is, that's horrific, that's awful, I feel so bad for them, I feel so bad for the family, I want to help, right? That's the internal feeling, it's beautiful, like that's the best part of society, like that's what we should have, empathy, kindness, right? That is not the case with mental illness. Inside, the majority of time when I would tell people, if I had the balls to tell people that I was struggling with severe depression, can you believe it, right? I would actually say that. And the majority of time that I would say that, you know, I'd have people, literally, this was their reaction. I'm not frozen. That was their reaction. They would just stare at you and they would make you feel more awkward. And that would isolate you more. And that would make you want to talk about it less. And the entire time you're doing that, the disease, I bet you personify the disease, the disease is just sitting back laughing. The disease is like, this is great. I don't have to do anything here. This is just the stupidity of society killing these people. And that's 100% what it is. And so when you feel shamed, ostracized, labeled, uh, and then you talk to somebody and you have the guts to bring up the fact that you have a disease that you didn't ask for, that you're talking to people about, and they make you feel even more awkward about it, it's horrible. And so you're absolutely exacerbating uh, the, the death of people, 100%. Oh, there's so much in there, what you said. Um, I'm just going to pick it apart a bit. You mentioned some really important points. The first one you mentioned was the old idea of the institution. And that's yes. huge. And movies, you know, although we, we've enjoyed watching them all, we could name loads of them, yep. uh, iconic films. Uh, they are there for entertainment. It does touch upon very sensitive areas. Some people have been on those wards and have been in those old, old buildings. I've, yep. I've seen them in, in the UK. I mean, we're talking about 18th century buildings here that yep. are still used. Um, so, you know, being sectioned, as we call it here in the UK. And also you mentioned the issue of waiting, being either embarrassed or fearful of seeking help. Yep. And that's a huge, huge problem uh, for fear of judgment, fear yep. of anything. And, you know, the ironic thing is you go to a doctor, a doctor who takes an oath to help people, and people are afraid to go to their doctors as well. So it shouldn't be like that. So the work you're doing which we're going to come to here in a second, is important. 
Now, I know you mentioned uh, in some of the work you've done, unmet needs. So when you were seeking help, maybe we could start out with just that bit. Yeah. How did you know that perhaps there was something just a little bit different and that you needed to seek some help? It's a wonderful question. So it was around a decade ago. I was, you know, on the surface, you know, I, I, I was the, the guy who was just having my third kid moving back from San Francisco to the East Coast and climbing up the corporate ladder. And so I'm, I was, you know, a high functioning person. And inside my, my easiest way that I try to think about it is my soul just started getting crushed. You know, my self-esteem was getting extremely low. I have this very vivid memory of not wanting to be in a picture. That was kind of the start of this. I was like, oh, I don't want to be in that picture. I don't want to see myself, right? And then the napping started. You know, my my one nap a day turned into two naps and then turned into, you know, I, I say lying. Nobody really talks about that much, but lying to get out of things. You know, my wife, hey, we got to go to dinner with friends. Oh, I'm not feeling that good, right? I've, I've got a stomach ache, you know, like these little things just to get out of having to, to be around people, right? And so all of that just continued to just increase, increase. And in over a decade long battle that I had with depression, you know, the only consistency that I had was each day, it got a little worse, you know, 0.05% worse, right? Every day, there was literally no relief. And it started with the first decision to, oh my gosh, can you believe it? Are you ready for this? I went to see a therapist, you know, I, I, I sure as heck couldn't talk about that with society because once again, it makes zero sense that it's okay for us to take care of our teeth twice a year, to take care of our eyes, to take care of our physical health. But the most complex computer in the world and our brain, for some reason, society is is so uh, absurd that you can't talk about that, which is, which again, goes to my stigma aspect. But um, that started my journey. You know, I, I went to therapy and they told me, listen, I think you have... Uh, major depressive disorder. And in my mind, I was like, huh? Like, what is, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, and I, I went home and looked it up and it was absolutely exactly uh, what I had. And, you know, that was the start of my, all right, let's figure out how we can fix this. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now back to the show. Right. And did you, through your journey and learning sort of how to help yourself, did you find any needs that were unmet through that journey? Oh, my. Um, so many. I mean, my, my actual journey, the simplified quick version of my journey was um, over 10 medications. I had three stays in a residential, two stays in a residential treatment facility. I had three partial hospitalization plans, three intensive outpatient programs. I did psychedelics, I did transcranial magnetic stimulation, 36 rounds of that, and then I did electroconvulsive therapy, which was 11 uh, rounds of that. In 2022, to tell you what severe depression looks like, I was under anesthesia 15 times in one year. That's what it looks like. And, the, and keep in mind, the entire time while I did every single thing that I listed to you, I'm being judged, stigmatized, and ostracized. Pretty horrific, right? Put that into any other condition and you'd be the worst absurd person ever in the planet, but it's acceptable for mental illness. And so I come out of um, this in, this wild battle that I had and you know, the unmet needs that are out there are the caretaker. You know, the only person that this is worse for than the person suffering is the care caretaker, caregiver. In that case, it was my wife. You know, my wife... Um, Talk about signing up for it, right? I mean, like we all know what it's like to start and form a relationship. It's amazing, right? It's butterflies in the stomach. It's let's go out to dinner. Let's hang out. This is the best, right? Like it's so much fun to hang out, but there's just like chemistry and a mutual attraction. And you don't think, you know, what's it going to be like when we have three children moving across the country and my husband is deteriorating for a decade, right? And and she was just right there, man. And, you know, she became... She was a, a wife and a mom. And the next thing you know, she's a she's a father. She's has to go back and get uh, get another degree to go back to work. And everything was on her. And 
Again, let's go back to stigma. When you have cancer, this, the neighborhood, the family, the friends, they line up. I call it a casserole disease. People want to bring you stuff, want to help, right? That's not the case with mental illness. So my wife is doing all of this with zero support and help because guess what? She feels labeled an ostracized too because society is stupid. And so that I would say is probably the biggest unmet need is all you need to do all you need to do is be proactively kind. That's it. I had one time I came home in this journey and I told my neighbor knew that I was struggling big time. And um, I came home and my lawn was mowed. He mowed my lawn. Do you know how amazing that made me feel? I still feel it to this day. Like, I mean, cost me zero money for him to do that, right? But it showed me he cared about me and it was incredible. Um, unmet needs galore. I, I, you, you, we only have a, an hour. I could talk for 27 hours on this, but here's the quick one if I had to simplify them. So the biggest issue that we have and the un biggest unmet need that we have is, is absolutely annihilating, pulverizing, obliterating the stigma of mental illness. That's absolutely number one. The second one is, um, is the medication, I mean, is the treatment. And so here's the simplest way that I'll put the treatment. So in the United States, in my opinion, it's by far our biggest public health crisis. It's, it's absolutely mental illness is more and more and more serious. Mental illness is huge. So I have a question for you. We're going to flip the script. I get to ask you a question, um, which you're in this field, so you probably know. How old do you think the gold standard for severe depression is? The gold standard treatment for severe depression, which is electroconvulsive therapy. This is the gold standard. This is what you use to treat it. How old do you think it is? I don't know. Tell me. It is older than the very first creation of a McDonald's restaurant. It is Which 10 year, It is ten years older than when women were allowed to vote in the United States of America. It was before World War II. Wow. So this is what we are using to treat severe depression, which is probably one of the most common conditions or most prolific conditions in the planet. Yes. How is this possible? Like when we think about the technology that has been created in every single other aspect of our life, what we're doing is we are as an unmet need. You can't get more of an unmet need than that. Millions and millions and millions and millions of people suffering, struggling. And I did ECT. I have many friends that did ECT too. And I can tell you the consistency that we have from ECT. Yes. Does it work for some people? Yes. The consistency that we have for ECT from my experience and from everybody else's experience is it doesn't work. Mm. And it, for me, not only did it not work, it made me worse. I ended up having severe side effects. I would fall over. I was literally so dizzy. I would fall over into my bed. Mm. I have significant memory loss from the time. Um, and let me tell you, how absolutely horrific it is to deal and live with a stigmatized condition. And guess what you get to have when you have a stigmatized condition? You get to add on that a stigmatized treatment. It's a lot of fun, right? One star, don't recommend. Doesn't get any worse than that. And so rather than everybody lining up to take you down to your chemotherapy, there's nobody lining up to take you down to the, the loony bin to get ECT. That's what we get. So another massive unmet need there is treatments. We need to absolutely inc improve them. And so, yes, I'm a version of that improvement, but still it takes a long time to get this approved and go on. And in the United Kingdom, it's I'm sure different than it is the United States, but the United States, another I met need is our insurance system is horrific. It's awful. It's, it's miserable. And so not only am I trying to cure my mind, my mind is wrecked, right? Completely obliterated, obliter obliterated from this disease. How do you cure your mind when you're going financially in debt, when you're, when you're absolutely getting financially destroyed? And so I had to, for instance, with transcranial magnetic simulation, I had to pay $495 36 times on my credit card, hoping that maybe I would be reimbursed from my insurance. So while I have, while, while I have my family back home, like completely watching me deteriorate, I'm trying to get better and I'm financially ruining my family. That's the environment that we have. So those are, I think, three of the biggest unmet needs by far is uh, the absurdity of society. The fact that our medical treatments are as absolutely abysmal as they can be for, for this condition. And then just general, like, how do you, how do you heal when you're financially being ruined? And it's across the board. It's not just a, this is a John thing. This is a, this is just what happened to him. 
it is so incredibly consistent um, with everybody that I speak to, and especially here in the States. I mean, there's rarely um, somebody who's not paying out of pocket for therapy, even to the level of basic therapy. Wow. I, I'm, I, I don't know what to say. Now, just quickly going in secession. Yeah. Yes, something about World War II stuck in my mind about ECT because of obviously the films that you see when you're training as a therapist and all of that. Yep. Um, but the issue of funding, even though we have the national, our national health service here, you do get, you know, therapy free. You can get therapy free. You can get all treatment Great. free. Some medications free. That still doesn't solve a lot of the problems. There's still funding issues and, you know, people are still looking for the right treatment. So, but, but yes, I could imagine that having an additional worry, like such as finances, mm -hmm. is uh, only compounding the problem. Can so, I add one thing to what you're saying? Is yes, please. So I gave a kudos to the younger generation as pro mental illness. Here's another thing that I will say is the United Kingdom and Canada, you guys are a step above where we are in the States. It's, it is more, it is definitely more accepted. And like you just said, you can provide, you provide, you provide therapy and, and there's the, the cost aspect isn't there. So is it perfect? Probably, absolutely not. I'm sure it's not, but take, take what you have and cut it in half. And that's what we have in the United States. Well, hopefully there'll be some changes. Um, yep. That's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother issue for a whole nother podcast, you know. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah. But hopefully, fingers crossed, there'll be some changes there because, yeah. yes, it, 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 yeah, it needs to happen. Um, abolition. Mm. I, the people, I, you know, when I say that word, there'll be some people looking it up. There'll be some people who immediately know what it means for you. What does that mean for you? Gosh, it's one of uh, such a phenomenal question. And going through a decade battle, I breathe high, heavy because it's just still mind boggling to me, pun intended, that it took until the very morning of um, you know my surgery, which I know we'll get into, where a neurologist who was leading my clinical trial said to me, I said, doc, like, I can't walk my dog. Like, I can't even walk my dog. And she just looked at me and just validated everything inside of me and said, oh, yeah, there's a medical reason for that. It's called abolition. It's you can't do daily routine activities. And I, I looked, I was like, what, what are you talking about? And I, I was like, in a decade, nobody's ever told me that. And so that's an absolute major miss by every single person in healthcare uh, to not bring that up to patients because Again, the disease is sitting back there laughing at healthcare professionals for not talking about this because it's making the misery in the person worse. And so if the goal of this disease is to crush my soul and to absolutely obliterate my insides with the goal of making me want to die every single second of every day, not understanding that there's a medical reason why I can't do anything is, is a major miss, absolute major miss. And so I was like, the only thing I said to this person before I'm going into his surgery is, can you please go tell my wife that? Please let her know that I wasn't, it wasn't a character flaw for me to go upstairs and wrap myself in my comforter in my dark room with my fan blasting with the room as cold as it could be instead of doing yoga and meditation, instead of going out and walking. It's because I couldn't do it. It's literally the disease. And so that to me is infuriating that even to the even to that little level of care, if we're trying to treat people, we're trying to make people conquer these diseases, how in a decade across every single thing that I mentioned to you was I never notified of that? It, it's a, just a massive miss. And so um, that's another thing. That's an unmet need, right? Not, I'm going back again. Everything I say is going to be an unmet need, massive unmet need. Uh, and I and I use any single platform I have around physicians. I absolutely scream it. I'm like, make this be one of the first things you say. Go onto any message board that you can with major depressive disorder. Read the titles of every single post. They are all the exact same thing. Isolated, afraid, can't do anything, scared, what's wrong with me, blah, 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 blah. Every single one of those is answered. 
by just explaining to them medically what's going on with you. You have a brain disease. The primary symptom that you have, many symptoms, but isolation, the, the not being able to do daily routine activities, all of that is not you. It's the disease. It's the symptoms. You know, people can understand Parkinson's, it's tremors, right? That's a symptom of the disease, right? You, there's a symptom of every disease, epilepsy, seizures. But for some reason, people can't accept that the symptoms of, of major depressive disorder and serious mental illness, they just, they don't see them. They can't accept them. Again, that's what kills people. Yes. Oh, that's such a good example. Um, and I want to ask you as well, so that people get an idea of yep. what it's like to be depressed. Yep. Um, the number of times I've heard from people that, oh, they're just lazy. Oh, yes. they just... Yes. Uh, they just don't want to work out. Oh, they just like to sleep. Oh, they, you know, that. So early in my career, a patient said to me, and one of the things I said well, was, "What about making your your favorite cup of tea?" And she said, "Shah, making a cup of tea for me is like climbing Mount Everest." Yeah, abolition. Exactly. So, uh, and that was stunning yep. because it's a stark difference from, oh, I don't feel like it to, oh, no, I actually cannot do it. I simply so, can't. Yeah. Just such a beautiful example. So, so think of the mindset there of this person. So she doesn't know that there's a medical reason for her not being able to make a cup of tea. So she's like, why do I not have the willpower to do that? I must be a horrible person inside and have no motivation. This is me. This is me. This is me. Because they're not told that. So so take that time to decade, right? With all the other thoughts that you have going on in your mind, this disease wants your mind to race with hell constantly. That's all it wants to do. And so to answer your question of what what is it like to live with this, I will first start off with the flip to that question of um, you know, people just thinking you're lazy and so forth. I love it when I hear that because you're proving to me your ignorance. And so here's the here's the example is um, I will, like I said, we'll, we'll talk about the surgery. But after the surgery, when I was when I was in remission of this horrific disease, about six weeks afterwards, I woke up and I felt sad and I completely um I, I completely uh, went down in regards to my behavior. I was right back into the disease of depression. And so I'm talking to my clinical team and they're like, listen, they're like, you're fine. They're like, what you're feeling right now is an emotion of sadness. And I said, ah, I was like, that's it. And so when you have your standard emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, right? Everything that you have, but the beautiful part about being a human being is that they come into your body and they leave your body. That's the whole point, the cycle, right? You can wake up being a little bummed and then you go have your afternoon tea with your friend and you're cool, right? Like you're back to happy or you're, you're in a loving mode. That's the cycle of life, right? Um, and so what the disease of depression is to the most simplistic perspective for people to understand is if you have a zero to 10 scale, 10 being death, if you have that human emotion of sadness, let's say it's at about a three, right? Then you get your afternoon tea and it's out, it's gone. So the disease of depression is anywhere from a five to a 10, again, 10 being death. And it never, ever, ever, ever leaves your body, ever. It's just completely hanging out in your body, making you feel horrific the entire time. And so the people that state that it's purely you're focusing on emotion, you're focusing on, yeah, I've dealt with that before. I got over it. Totally, dude, because you were sad, right? And you, and you flipped it by the end of the day. That's the difference with the disease. For me, my, my major primary symptoms, I mean, yeah, everything. Think about it. You have, you have substance abuse because when you feel horrific for a decade, and you're not feeling any better. Absolutely, is it easy to drink more? Uh, drink more alcohol for sure. Because guess what? That's the only thing that's providing me a little bit of relief. And that's actually something that I would say to family members to take a, to keep in mind is when you think about the level of disease or uh, that somebody has, or they're not behaving um, like they typically do. You know, when you see that increased isolation, when you see that increased drinking or substance abuse. 
that's somebody telling you that they are really struggling inside because they're just trying to feel better and nothing's working, right? So for me, my biggest symptoms were constant suicidal ideation. I can tell you every single tree in my neighborhood, uh, in my town, that would be the best tree for me to slam my car into with my seatbelt off and die instantly. Um, I can tell you I can tell you every single place that I would go in order to end my life where my family wouldn't have to find me, right? That That's the level of like mindset that I had the entire time. I was euphoric to die. Like all I wanted to do is die. But again, I'm going to keep giving you all these uh, analogies throughout this whole time. When you die from cancer, what do you get? You get life insurance. You get your family taken care of. You have society hugging your family. Oh my God, I feel so bad for you. Let me take care of you, right? Here's, here's the blah, 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 right? Like that's how it's beautiful. When I say these analogies, I say them with love. I say them with like, that's how it should be, right? With, with serious mental illness, you die by suicide. And so you even get judged by how the disease kills you. And then you don't get life insurance, and so you're dealing, this is how horrible, other than a straight up terminal diagnosis like ALS, it's the worst disease that you can have because this label shame ostracizing for a decade that you go through, the moment you die, that gets transferred over to your family. And so now your family gets to feel judge labeled and ostracized. Read every obituary that you have, that you see from people who've died by suicide versus, versus obituaries that you see from people that died by cancer. That's proof point 7,422 uh, in regards to everything that I'm saying. So constant desire to die, euphoric for death. My entire perspective was how do I die and make it look like an accident? If I can do that, then... My kids have a dad who died by an accident, so they don't have to be labeled and shamed by the stupidity of society. My wife gets life insurance. She can financially take care of our family, and I don't have to suffer, right? That was my answer. It's like, well, maybe there's a deer that could be a deer there, so maybe, maybe it'll look like when I do have the car wreck, it was a deer. Maybe I can go clean my gutters, and I could fall off the gutters and fall head first into the asphalt, right? That's where you go. That that was excitement to me, right? That's what this disease does. And so that's a primary symptom. The other one for me was, um, you know how you get the aches and shakes when you have a fever, you know, like the chills feeling, that whole body sensation. So that entire body sensation, you know, you feel it, right? So replace that with a constant feeling of dread. Replace that with feeling you're looking at your pinky, your pinky, looking at your index finger and feeling inside your blood circulating and it being like death. That's what it's like for me 24 seven after trying every single thing that I did, nothing worked. Yes. And I'm sure listeners, viewers out there, some of this, a lot of this will be resonating with you. And if you've had the same thoughts, feelings, experiences, there's going to be some information in the show notes that you can go both on John's website, but also I will put the links to some help that you can get. Because as John has been saying, it's really important to reach out and to seek the help. Thank you for explaining that because it's not as simple as someone not being motivated or enthusiastic enough. It yep. is just not the same. Absolutely not. Let's talk about the, your surgery and, and some of the difficulties uh, you've endured. So my surgery, after I came out of my second residential treatment facility, my family did some research and figured out that there was a clinical trial out of Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City with the lead investigator of that trial being Dr. Helen Mayberg, who is, in my opinion, the best neurologist in the world. Clearly, I'm uh, biased, uh, but I'll take that bias. And um, so I had to, basically, this was for the most severe of severe treatment-resistant depression. And it was a brain surgery called deep brain stimulation. And so deep brain stimulation became a procedure about 20 years ago, and it was mostly known for Parkinson's disease. And so they figured out where in the brain, if they stimulate electricity, you immediately take the folks tremors and they stop instantaneously as soon as you start putting electricity into the brain there. 
And so what Dr. Mayberg and her team have done for 30 years is try to figure out specifically in the brain where they need to stimulate to cure depression. And so I, my first phone call I got, I was literally in the treatment facility with them. It was an intake call. And I was just psyched. Like, I don't know if they do it over there, but back here in my day, I'm 48. So I'm an old dude now, but you used to have like interviews for colleges and stuff. You know, I felt like that. It was like, I was going to my favorite college and had an interview, you know? And, um, and everything was great, except for I hadn't done one inclusion criteria. So clearly they need you to, to meet all of these goals in order to be their inclusions. And so ECT, I had not done. And so I said, listen, if I do it, uh, and I fail it, which I know I will, would you guys consider me? And they said, we absolutely would take the call. And so um, November was when I had that call of 2021, January through March, I did ECT. I failed it miserably, um, got back in contact with them in May. And I got accepted in the trial. So May of 2022, um, I live outside of Philadelphia. So it's about a two and a half hour door to door commute, subways, trains, I mean, it's plane trains and automobiles. Like it's all of that. Uh, you know, I, I get to this uh, facility, the hospital, I probably did it 50 times. Um, the commute, a lot of testing, a lot of lab work, a lot of mind uh, analysis, um, CTs, MRIs, everything, PET scans galore. Um, it's data, right? They're trying to get as much data as they can on their subjects before they do the surgery. And uh, it was it was an absolute uh, incredible day. So it was August 22nd of 2022. Um, you know, my my family drops me off in, in New York City. My, my kids, we drop off with my in-laws. Um, you know, just an amazingly emotional moment. You know, my young guy at the time was uh, 10. And, you know, he looks up at me and just says, you know, Dad, am I going to see you again? And you know, hearing him say that it was it was it was the first time that I wanted to live in a long time. I mean, I wanted to live. Obviously, I love my children. I love my wife. Right. But it was it was the first time uh, the day before the surgery that I got a little scared because uh, I was like, oh, my God, like, I do hope I make it through this because before that, I didn't care at all. It was like I was going to my primary care office for a physical. I could care less. I, I get that all the time. It's like, were you scared about your eight-hour brain surgery where they wake you up halfway through it? No, I didn't care because the worst case scenario was I died. And then I got everything that I wanted, right? I got the life insurance. I got the dad who died of an accident on the table. And there's not the shame and labeling and blaming. And I was like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. And um, that was kind of my first real moment of like, all right, like, let's get through this. Let's see if this can work. This is severe. This is severe enough of an intervention that maybe it could work, you know. And um, I walk into that table. Um, Dr. Mayberg has that 530 in the morning conversation with me about abolition. And uh, she, it was really funny because she said to me, she's, she's, she's intense in a great way. She elevates like her level of intelligence. I, I could talk to anybody. It's, she still makes me kind of fumble my words a little bit because she's just at a different level. And, um, and so she said, you know, I just need, so they told me beforehand, they're like, she's going to give you a pumped up speech. It's like a locker room speech before a big game. And uh, she just, you know, the big thing that she was mentioning, she's like, I need you to be present. I need you to be present. All right. Just focus on that and got it, doc. And so about halfway through the surgery, they wake me up and, you know, and, and literally all of a sudden she's right in my face. She's like, hey, doc. She's like, hey, John, Dr. Mayberg, we're here in the operating room, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was so with it that I was literally cracking jokes with her. Like, I was like, hey, doc, come here. I got to tell you something. And she's, you know, comes over. I'm like, just want to let you know I'm present, you know, just just trying to get a laugh. And she was joking around. It was just fun, right? So it's one of these moments where you're awake with your head open with them talking about where they're putting the electrodes in your brain. You can't feel it. But like, I heard them literally talking about the placement of the electrodes as they're doing this. You're totally with it. And they had me playing a scientific video game that I had played many, many times before. I was unaware of why I was doing it, but I played it once um, while I'm awake, while my brain's open, while they're putting electrodes in. And then they stopped the game and they had me do it again. But they turned the device on, which I was unaware of. So they're looking at my brain activity while I'm playing this game with the device off, with the device on to make sure that they're stimulating the right areas. I go back to sleep. I wake up. I spent my first night in the hospital uh, ever and did not sleep well, slept about as ex exactly how you would expect. And the next morning at 10 a.m., after an eight-hour brain surgery, I'm I'm uh, discharged from the hospital. It's amazing how, how advanced everything is nowadays. Uh, and I go up to their lab. And so to let you know how big of a deal the surgery was, 
um, behind the line. So like behind the operating actual area, uh, there were 27 people in there, researchers from around the world um, that were in there to kind of witness this and be around this. And then the next day, same thing. There's all those people are there either in the room as they turn on the device or in an overflow room with a conference with a uh, like a Zoom kind of showing what we're doing. And so Dr. Mayberg um, sat down across from me for two hours and she would ask me one question. And they turned on uh, each of the uh, eight electrodes um, over that two hour period. And so the question was, John, um, do you feel like you can walk your dog? And literally I would sit there, think about it. I was like, I feel a little bit more motivated. Like, I think I probably could do that. And then they would turn that portion off and they would ask that question again. So what it looks like is kind of right behind my eyes, like in that portion of the brain, I have two leads that go down. And at the bottom of each lead, there's four little circles. Those are four little areas that um, emit electricity. And so what they were trying to do is figure out in my brain, what is the most effective of those eight different spots to stimulate? So over that two hour period, she goes through this and I'm tired, right? I've tried to stay awake. I'm super tired. I'm, I feel like I'm failing at this. You know, everybody's staring at me and it was all, it was great. Right. But I mean, it was just like the, the you know, these are the things that you just don't expect. And, uh, and so what they do is they put a pacemaker here. So the pacemaker is a battery. I got the wire that goes up my neck, the electrodes that go down. After that two hour period, they literally huddled. They literally got in a huddle, her and a bunch of other doctors, and they just looked at me and said, go home, you're good, got it on, device is on. And from that very moment, so August 23rd, 2002, the day after my surgery, they turned that on. I have not had a single suicidal thought. I have not felt the, the disease in any single portion of my body. And I'm 1000% proof that this is a brain disease. All that I have in my body is an electrical deficiency. That's it. That's the only thing that I have. So I have 23 million electrical pulses per day going to my brain. Um, this works constantly. It's not like a heart pacemaker where it blasts when it needs to. This is literally going 24 seven. And so I have to charge this every two days. I have like a little remote charger I posted over myself. And then here's the problem. If it turns off, I'm decimated. And so part of this trial was six months in, they had to turn it off for a week. And I was freaked. I was like, oh my God, you know, let me, let me tell you, uh, when you have the two options of feeling like dying every day and not feeling like dying every day, the, the latter option is much more enjoyable. And so I was just, I spent the majority of my six month therapy time with the clinical research team about what am I going to do when they turn this off? What am I, how, this is going to be horrible. And it was uh, when they did turn it off, it was about four days in, they, um, uh, I, I just started feeling it all in my body. So like my entire body just started getting ravaged by it. I started overeating, oversleeping. Um, my wife, I still remember, asked me to go to a student conference with my son. I was like, I can't go. Um, so immediately into the trauma of the disease. Uh, and then by the time they turned it on the week later, it took me about a month to get back up the baseline. Uh, but that, that's how much I need uh, the electricity. And so this is the unique part about it is... So think about this scenario. So an anemic person has an iron deficiency. That's all it is, right? You, you get the iron up and you're good, right? Could you imagine labeling, shaming, ostracizing, making that person feel horrific because they have an iron deficiency in their body? Like that would be the dumbest, most absurd thing ever. Like you literally couldn't come up with a scenario more outrageous than that. But that's all we get. So I'm proof that this is a circuit off in your brain. So the circuit off in your brain with Parkinson's stimulates and you're good, right? You go back 10 years in your life. The circuit's off in my brain, but my symptoms are wanting to die and having a feeling of death circulating through my body constantly. And now I have electricity there and I'm golden. I'm totally fine. I just have literally my medicine is electricity. That's all it is. And so this is where it's fun for me. I, I'm, I don't like getting messed with. I don't like it. I don't like, I I'm kind of, I'm not Sicilian, but I got that like funny Sicilian temperament. It's like, I don't forget. Right. And, um, and that's where I am with this. I'm pissed. And so this, this disease, what it's done to me and to millions of other people, um, it picked me for a reason. It was not a fun decade, but I'm psyched. I'm psyched to pick me now because I like a good fight. 
Um, and I'm going to absolutely do everything I can. As I mentioned in the very beginning, I'm going to punch it in the face as hard as I can for the rest of my life. And I'm going to do everything I can to motivate the majority of society to understand that their thought process is killing people. Let's take a quick break from the show just for a moment so that you can go and grab a drink, have a little walk around your chair or desk, have a stretch, do something that helps. Maybe just close your eyes and relax for a few moments. And this will be a space for me to tell you a bit about the Nine Peaches Therapies recordings. And I started doing those recordings way back in the 90s when I started my practice. And it was really because I found that when people practiced the techniques that I taught them within a session, they made strides, they got further, quicker, faster, and more potently. And therefore, these recordings I made for people to take away and listen to. And then, of course, CDs happen. I know they're antiques now. They're heirlooms. So CDs happened. And so they took off. One of the favorite or best-selling recordings is about sleep. Give me restful sleep. And that says a lot. But also the confidence one and the relaxation one does a lot. So... Here's just a little space, very relaxing space now for you to listen to this ad. You can find all the recordings on Apple Music, Spotify, and loads of other streaming platforms. So I hope you enjoy it. And sometimes you just need to work on yourself and you need to give yourself self-care and you do need to relax. Enjoy. Your mental health is a priority. Nine Peaches Therapies offers gentle and soothing therapy for your mind, your body, and your soul. These self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by providing what you need right now, be it confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. The soothing, calming music has been specially composed to accompany the body of words created by me, an expert practitioner, to help you to achieve the best result. Reprogram your mind using the most gentle and effective guided meditations infused with highly suggestible hypnosis to rid yourself of anxiety, fear, stress, and negative thinking. These guided meditations can help you to clear and cleanse any unwanted energy that may be negatively affecting your everyday life. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day. Nine Peaches Therapies, Holistic Therapeutic Consultancy. You were so brave, number one, so brave to do that. You know, it's, it's um, amazing that you say that. I, I, I don't, I don't know. It's like, I just, and so here's the thing. I think probably the most important thing that I want you to take away and everybody to take away from here is I'm not better than anybody that's died by suicide. Not at all. I, I actually flip it. I think the people that have died by suicide, they're probably the strongest people that I've ever known. If you've gone through serious mental illness and you die by suicide, you are extremely strong for making it as long as you did. Because it is that horrific of a feeling. It is that horrible of a situation. And society aids that. I was just at a 9.9. So my severity was right on the line, right? I just wasn't at the 10, right? I hadn't lost every single connection. And so that's what this disease does, is it takes... It's not the person. It's not Bob. Can you believe Bob took his own life? It's not took your own life. It's died by suicide. So can you believe that Bob died by suicide? Oh my God, he had so much. The disease literally takes every single connection that you have the reality and eliminates it. It takes over your body. It literally takes control of your body and the disease is the one that kills you. That's what happens. But the way that it happens, again, versus any other disease, 
you get blamed by how the disease takes you. You die from pancreatic cancer, nobody's blaming the person because it's how you died. How you die with this is exactly what the disease is trying to do. It just adds to the misery of having mental illness. So in regards to bravery for me, um, it's a very kind of you to say that. Um, I appreciate it greatly. I think for me, it was just, if I, I mean, here's the reality of this. And again, this isn't to make people feel bad who have children who have died by suicide is I, I purely had one connection still keeping me on this planet, one. Um, and again, this is not meaning that people who have died by suicide, their children aren't important. They're the most important thing in the world to them. But for me, I hadn't lost that one tiny connection, which was, I could not imagine my children having to go to school after my funeral and being labeled shamed and ostracized by their peers. And so that was the one tiny connection to reality that I still had. And so I was like, all right, I'm good. I'm signing myself up for misery for the rest of my life. I'll, I'll, I, will, I will take this. And so to me, it was just one more chance, right? It was like, all right, <laughs> who knows if this will work, but at least I'm trying, right? It, you know, I'll guinea pig the heck out of it. I tell that team all the time. I'm like, guys, if you need my left arm for science, take it. I don't care. I literally did a spinal tap after the surgery for another thing because they needed treatment resistant spinal tap fluid. I'm like, whatever, let's go. I'll, I'll do it. You know, so it's uh, so that's my long answer to your very kind question. No, I get it. Thank you for explaining that because that was me preempting it. Really, I was just there was my perception and. And this is the beauty of this podcast. It's so that you guys can set us straight and tell us exactly what it was. I just thought you were being brave, but I like what you just said about um, uh, perhaps it wasn't being brave. Maybe it was that you felt, look, I've got no other no other choice here. I mean, I I have something to I have just that little bit there where I want to be here. And that's it's different. Isn't yeah, it? I'd, I'd done mm -hmm. everything and nothing worked and there was no other option. And so if anything, it was a slight bit of hope because mm -hmm. I, it yeah. wasn't available. Right. And I, I, I weirdly met this criteria for it to be available and, and let's go, you know, and I, I get these questions sometimes by uh, medical ethicists and are they taking advantage of you because you're, you're not in a good place? Like, I don't understand it. Like, I'm like, why are we spending any of our time on this? Like flip the script again. I have doctors who actually look at me in the face. Like I would go in for this clinical trial. So innovation saved my life. Absolutely. Medical innovation. And ideally this will be available to the masses sooner than later. They just started the formal FDA clinical trials in the States um, through Abbott. Abbott is the medical device company taking this through. They just started it this month. And so hopefully, um, hopefully that happens. But I mean, it's it's just it's just been an absolute journey ride, and uh, you know, if anything, it was just one more one more possibility for me to get better. And I just I didn't I there was only option I had, so it was like a slight bit of hope. And hope is not something that you get ever uh, it, with these diseases. And hey, man, sign me up. I'll I'll take it. I'll try it. And oh my, have the results been been wonderful? I just finished my two-year anniversary um, recently. So I had my good old remission party with uh, good families and friends, and I've been celebrating it immensely. And just the language you're using it helps to normalize it in a way, just like we normally speak about cancer and all other diseases. Yep. Having a remission, you know, celebration. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. You and know, that's, what, that's what it's called. That's what it's called. It's exactly. an amazing. And that's the start for, for me, for the public, for all of us. That's the start of bridging the gap. Yeah. And yeah. starting to see it as another issue, another disease. Absolutely. What used to bother me early in my career was people would always talk about, um, oh, there's no such thing as a disease of the brain. And oh, there's no imbalance, that was it. There's no imbalance of the brain. I never understood how people thought that or where they got it. Maybe imbalance wasn't the right word, but that's what people were saying. And I think what you described with this new research, this new technology, uh, and it's very common for, for um, other medical teams to 
look in and be on Zoom and watching those new surgeries yep. very common. And that's why I felt you were brave because any any um, surgery comes with risks, of course. Yeah. Anesthesia is the number one risk. Yeah. And then we go on from there. But um, you, I think that's going to help a lot of people knowing when you feel, okay, there may be a bit of hope here. Um, I wonder too, just quickly, do yeah. you think maybe ECT was trying to maybe get somewhere the way that i look at ect i just always try to simplify things is it's like or when you're where do you reset your computer right it's like oh my computer's acting a little funny hold down the power key let's reset it right like that's what in, in general it's trying to do um does not work at least for me uh, yeah. with this it's it's just constant stimulation of electricity into very specific portions of the brain and they're studying this right now in ocd and binge eating disorder and addiction and i met a woman who had it for uh ocd and so again, another serious mental illness to explain the brain disease. So her portion of her brain for OCD is much deeper in the brain and it needs about double the electricity that mine does. So she went from 17 hours a day in her home in her shower because every time she'd step out, she was contaminated and had to go back in, not leaving her home for three years to she's a quote unquote normal human being immediately. She's a completely functioning person in society. All she has too is an electrical deficiency. That's it. And so it's it's just amazing to know that, you know, the most complex computer we have in the planet is uh, we're trying to figure out more and more about it. And it's saving humanity. Absolutely. So much more to learn. And this is why research is so important. It is. So to add to your point, unmet need, I'll go back to again, I said three earlier, I'm going to add four because of research. I mean, the only way that we cure and handle and develop as a society is to to fix these problems and this is a number one reason for disability in the globe depression number one reason of suicide number one main cause depression right you add all these things up and it's like clearly we have an absolute major miss and so my my trial was um funded by the national institute of health brain initiative in the united states and so to let you know an unmet need I didn't think about that. I didn't think the government saved my life. I thought Dr. Mayberg and her team did. And I got a call from the National Institute of Health and they were said, hey, we're doing a congressional briefing. Would you come with us? And we want to talk to them about kind of the importance of what our research is doing. Absolutely. The reason that they had me come and to tell my personal story and to try to influence them from a budgetary standpoint is guess what Congress decided to do in 2024? They decided to cut the NIH Brain Initiative funding by 40%, $350 million. So they can't, they can't invest in new research. It, it's not possible to happen. And so the new research now, all they can do is extend current research that they've already invested in. And so you have the government now saying it's not important. Like, what are we doing? Like, so, so you, we've, we've now figured out cures that can, that can absolutely change humanity. And we as a government are saying, now nah, we're good. Like, we don't need to invest in more research. It's just, like, all completely absurd to me. That is incredible. Um, yeah, oh, that was it. Something else you, you – because, you, John, you were giving us so much good information here. I, I'm going all over the place. But there's one thing the I wanted to mention that you mentioned earlier in the podcast. It was something to do with culture. And I have found in my work some cultures actually don't believe – in mental health problems, you know, oh, yeah. we face that a lot. Some cultures yeah. don't believe in dementia or Parkinson's or mental can't health. Even, can't even talk about it. Don't even talk about it. Can't even talk about it. That's Guess right. what? Guess what that makes you do? That makes people die. Exactly. It's true. True statement. Exactly. I've even known families who've, who've flown their relatives back to wherever because they didn't want them to be treated. So... Uh, so it's just every time you say or fear that or anybody says it, replace it with pancreatic cancer. Exactly. I'm going to send them back home because they're complaining about their pancreatic cancer. Absurd, right? Makes no sense, but Absurd. that's what we get. Exactly. Luckily, there are laws here in the UK that can help prevent it, actually. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So doctors can take cases to court and that can prevent the relative from... That's phenomenal. Way, which is brilliant. Let's talk about One Mind. I, I'm i so drawn to the music festival part, mm. but uh, just because I'm a huge music buff. 
But tell us about One Mind, how it started and how you got involved. You know, so I've been very, very, very fortunate over the last year. I've kind of started my own consult, my own company, LLC. It's just me, right? And I, I spent the majority of my uh, career in the life sciences industry, uh, in advertising and uh, kind of digital promotion. And so I, I know the space, I know the industry players. And, you know, one of the things that I succeeded with my career was um, I just people person, right? Like I'm a, I'm, I enjoy being around people. I enjoy uh, leadership. I enjoy getting the most out of your folks, but I never really liked the content, right? It, the content was never something that intrigued me. It was just more the people. And so where I'm at, where I'm at now, which is really fun is, um, I'm in the same world, right? Cause I'm in healthcare. I understand the players. I understand the, uh, the, the aspects of how it works, the business side, but I care about the content and I know it and I'm very passionate about it. And so it's been a blast. And so like ways that that has worked is, um, you know, group like one mind. So here, here's, here's what I'll explain to you. So they're, they're a not-for-profit in, in the United States. They're based out of uh, Napa, California. Um, the family is the Staglin family. They own, actually own Staglin Vineyards out in Napa. Their son, Brandon, who is now the, uh, he's the co-founder and uh, head of engagement and advocacy there. He was just recently the president, amazing person. And in his early 20s, he ended up uh, between years in school having a psychotic episode and was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And so he's been living with schizophrenia for 30 years. And his family said, well, let's let's figure this out. Like, let's start a foundation and let's make this happen. And it is the most beautiful foundation I've ever been around. They just won the Fast Company's Most Innovative Company Award. Last year, I was at the gala with them in New York City. They're a not-for-profit. They are, they are the most well-run machine I've ever been around in business. And so what they do, and this is the biggest thing that I'll say about mental illness, is unless you do it yourself, nothing changes. It, it, you have to do it. And so like I've created multiple support groups as an example because they don't exist. There's not a high-functioning support group that I know of. So I started one, right? It's like that's my, my thought process. They're taking that and putting it on steroids. And so they're just all about advancing um, science, advancing brain health and mental illness, but they do it the right way. They invest in the best rising star researchers, clinical researchers that are out there. They provide accelerator grants for mental health startups, but they don't just give them money. They bring them in and they make them amazingly successful businesses while bringing in some of the smartest people in the world to help them. I am part of their lived experience council. So lived experience is a main big word, big buzzword. Artificial intelligence is a big buzzword. Lived experience is now one too, which makes a lot of sense because companies um, that are in this space rarely consult with patients. And so they're trying to change that. And they're showing, hey, look at the value that these patients have to make what you are developing better. And so one of their accelerators that they had last year was a group called uh, Motif Neurotech. So Motif Neurotech, so I actually didn't even show you this. So my so my bumps on my head, like you can see them right here, right? Yeah. So I have my bumps here. Those are the caps that cover the holes in my head where the electrodes go down. So I have, my analogy is, I have the iPhone 1 in my head. These guys are creating the iPhone 16. So they have a device that's the size of a P that essentially there's going to be a burr hole put in your skull. There's going to be the P that's put there, cover it up. And essentially, it's going to be activated and it'll provide the same relief that mine does. But it's a 20-minute outpatient procedure. It has less side effects than a nose job, right? Like these are the advancements that we need to save millions and millions of people. I'm to them through one mind, right? I'm, I'm there because I can help them as a business get better and better and better. And, 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 it, and I get to focus on, so these are brilliant engineers, brilliant scientists, brilliant doctors, but they haven't lived with it for a decade, right? So most companies are too egotistical to do that. They're not. And that's what we need in order to advance uh, society and in order to advance medical technology and just fix this big problem that we have. Wow, <laughs> that's really good because you're absolutely right. Lived experience is huge. Yep. Um, in, a, in some of my roles, we have people with lived experience and they're absolutely necessary and needed. Yep. Because as healthcare professionals, you may not have lived experience. You'll be right. trained, you've got your degrees, but what do you really know? You don't know. Yep. So I love it when people say, Sean, how do you know? 
and they're right. I will sometimes I will say, no, you're right. I don't know. So tell me, tell me yep. about it. Yep. Um, yeah. So we do have to lessen the ego as healthcare professionals and listen to people who actually know. <laughs> because yeah, well, it, it's funny. It's like it, I, I love that statement, and I would I would I would tweak it a little bit, and I would say. I would. I don't even know if you have to lessen your ego, but you have to be open to collaboration. You have to be wow. open to other viewpoints, okay. right? It's. It's like, yeah, you clearly have gotten to where you are from all your education and kicking ass and doing great at your job and work, right? All those. All, everybody has in that environment, but it's like you need to be. You need to be open to mm -hmm. hearing another perspective, and you need to know that you're not perfectly right all the time, right? Like that. That's what it is. It's just. It's group. It's getting more information, and what's better than more information to make the right decision. That is true, absolutely, because, of course, a lot of our knowledge can help. Yep. You know, some things we've never been through. Certainly, lived experience is invaluable. So, certainly encourage all companies to have, and I think they are branching out. I wanted to ask you, John, with the onslaught of social media, and, I mean, you're still young, but... Um, you were around, I know you've told us your age earlier, but you were around when there wasn't mm -hmm. social media. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's been a help or hindrance for mental health? I think it's been a hindrance. I think that um, that's my gut. My gut is I, I just seeing, you know, humans evolve and sitting in an airport you know, terminal and looking at every single person and every single person staring at their phone, you know, but looking at what it's doing to mental health of the kind of younger generation and honestly, the older generation, I don't have the science behind it or the the stats. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're just evolving 100% differently now and our brains are stimulated all the time. And um, you know, clearly when you do look at the kind of teenage young, uh, numbers and so forth about mental illness and mental health and it increasing, it, you can, it, it just seems like a very simple correlation to it. Definitely. And I wonder too, if, um, if a lot of the information out there isn't always accurate, yep. uh, but also one of the things that professionals face at the moment is loads of people turning up self-diagnosed. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. that's not always helpful. Yeah. What would you say to people who, because I want to talk a little bit just before we end, about, yeah. oh, we've only got a minute, about yeah. the male versus female, because there is that. I'm oh, afraid. yes. I mean, uh, it's. Yeah. So is there still some stigma around men? It's, so stigma? I think the two biggest areas where stigma exists are the workplace and, um, and, and men, men. And so, you know, what are we taught by society? I mean, we, we go back to Roman times, right? It's the gladiators. It's we're machismo. We're so tough, right? It's your standard aspect of dudes don't talk about emotions. And yeah, it's it's fuel. It's fuel on the fire, right? I mean, it's it's 100% what it is. We are we are more accepting. We, we Right now, we're essentially uh, complacent to the fact that it's better for dudes not to talk and kind of deal with us all inside and die by suicide than, than the opposite of realizing that we're all human beings who have emotions and, and can't and should talk about them. I mean, the fact that we don't uh, take care of, like I said, our brain, like, what are we doing? Like, like, think about your relationships that you have in life. The ones that you are the closest and best with are the ones that you can absolutely be yourself around, right? Think about the people, your friends, your family, your coworkers. You're a hundred percent yourself. You're authentic. Like, why wouldn't we strive to do that instead of being these fake, the fake world that we have and trying to act like we have to be a certain type of person? It's not working, right? So let's be real. Let's be authentic. Vulnerability is okay. You know, let's let's be vulnerable and let's let's make this happen. And I will say. I'm the first person to admit that I'm very crusty about all this, right? Like I, I am not happy, but here's what I will tell you. I can be a little bit happy with a couple of things to be positive at. The most stigmatized condition in the planet 60 years ago was cancer. They called it the big C. Don't tell anybody you have it, right? Clearly, look at where we become as a society. So things can get better. So I am hoping that things get better. The thing that upsets me thoroughly about this is guess how much money it costs to save millions and millions of lives? I'm asking you a question. How much money do you think this would cost for us to fix this problem? I don't know. Tell us. Zero. 
Zero dollars. And so here's how we do it. Um, you know, I say pulverize the stigma all the time when I talk because that's what we need to do. It costs zero money for us to fix this problem. The, of all the unmet needs, the number one biggest one is the stigma. And so all that you need to do, it's it's absolutely only two things. If somebody tells you that they are struggling or suffering with mental illness, all you need to do is treat it like you would any other disease. You show empathy. And so you literally say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry you're going through this. You give them a hug, right? You give them a hug. Hey, I'm going to go get your son next tomorrow. And we're going to go out and we're going to, we're going to play football, right? We're going to do, let, let's, let's just help, right? So showing empathy and then being kind, proactively being kind. Mow your freaking neighbor's lawn. Bring them over a casserole, right? Do the stuff that you would do for any other condition. You show empathy, you be kind, and guess what? You save a life, 100%. That's all you have to do. And that's what's so frustrating to me about all of this is it's fixable. It's 100% fixable. And that starts with freaking humanity. That starts with being a good person. And so this is where I get aggressive because I'll come back to the aggressiveness, which I'm cool with, which is... You've had an hour here to understand what it's really like. So anybody inside that has that kind of internal feeling or externally promotes that stigma, we've given you an hour to educate yourself, right? To understand that the thought process is wrong. And so if you continue to feel it or you continue to state it, I have a very simple designation of what you are. And that means that is that you're a horrible person. That means that you enjoy watching people suffering and you enjoy watching people die. That's the reality of it. Again, let's go back to facts. That's a factual statement. What you are supporting and saying and feeling and thinking inside and pr pr promoting externally with people in conversations is false. That what you are doing is making people die. I even go as far to say that you're an accessory to murder because it's exactly what you are. And so if we do not change our behavior as a society, millions and millions and millions of people will continue to suffer and will continue to die purely because of your false thought process. Wow, that's so powerful. Really powerful words there. And as we close, I mean, John, I will say thank you so much. I mean, we have learned so much. I know our viewers will agree with me. And and just in the language that we understand, <laughs> you know, you've explained to us. Uh, and as we close, what would you say to someone who's thinking, right, it's time. I need to seek some help. Awesome. You're one of the strongest people I've known. And all the, don't let it win. Don't let the disease win. Turn it around on the competitive side, right? All you, you, you English Premier League fans over there, right? Think of it as your opponent trying to kick your butt. And it's the opposite. All, all you need to do here is talk about it. You know, you talking about it is winning. You going to the doctor is winning. You, you opening up about with a friend and saying, listen, I need some help. That's winning, right? That is you are kicking ass. Like that's it. all you need to do is do not let it keep you quiet. Do not let it isolate you. Do not make you feel worse about yourself. Go at it as, as go at it directly and, and, and you're winning. And that that's all that we can do is, is, you know, the, 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 the normal approach that we have to this right now is, is silence and ostracizing, do the exact opposite, try to find relief. That's another word that I would say to anybody listening here does not have this uh, horrific disease is you want to help try them find relief. You want to help them find moments of joy. That's all you need to do. And, and be there as a resource in order to make uh, these people suffering through this maniacally horrific disease feel a little bit better because there's, there is never, there's never a day where you kind of go down. It's always worse. And so when you have a day that's even neutrality, that's gold. John, you are the prime example of what it's like to be a person in their purpose showing up in the world the world is a better place because you're here and because you've made a choice because it was a choice to help to educate us all about how to just be a better human and oh, how to live it means uh, it means the world to me i'm telling you and i so my my um my funny aspect of all of this is first off, thank you. That's, that's truly all the fuel that I need. You know, I need like that type of feedback is just makes me so happy. And 
Um, you know, it's, that's all I'm trying to do. And I'm, I'm launching right now, which I, I you know, right after this uh, starts is something called pulverize the And it is for literally no other reason than to be a resource for people to go to, to get this type of information. Cause I get the same questions all the time. And it's, you know, in, in the entire goal of it is it's just, it's my personal brand to give the middle finger to society. That's all it is. I literally have no other reason to do it other than it's going to be a place to uh, hopefully upset some people. And I'm glad that it upsets them because they'll remember me and they'll know what to do when their partner comes to them later in life and says, I'm struggling with mental illness. They'll know to be empathetic and be kind. I'm, if you don't like me and that's their takeaway, awesome, because that's all that matters is taking care of the people that are hurt. Guys, go and follow John on all social media. Every link will be in the show notes pulverizethestigma.com. Go there now. Um, to also make, on to TikTok. Make, to make you laugh. This is how oh. much is part of my identity. Wonderful. Fantastic. Ooh, that must have hurt. That's the first thing I'm thinking. Ooh. It, it did uh, yeah. feel good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it did. Fantastic. John, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. And once everything is all up and running, come back and see us because... We just learned so much from you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank Amazing you. opportunity to be here. Can't thank you enough. And uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. So there you have it. My interview with the wonderful John Nelson. So much information, so much knowledge, so much wisdom. Thank you, John. My biggest takeaway from this interview was a quote from John. And it is, show empathy, be kind. And guess what? you save a life. That is powerful. And it's from John Nelson. Be sure to check out all of his uh, social media website, everything because he is a wealth of information. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you enjoyed the episode, be sure to like the episode and share your thoughts in the comments. I always welcome your feedback. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss out on any upcoming content. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, I'd be so grateful if you could leave us a five-star review. Your support means the world and it helps others discover the show and keep us inspired to continue. Thanks for being a part of the Inquisitive Rin family. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring.